For most languages, in order to test your code, you have to download a testing framework. In order to download that framework, you need to have some kind of package manager. In Java, a common package manager is Maven. If you haven't used Maven before, these are some instructions. I'll link them down below, but the command we'll want is this one. So this is a hello world type thing. It creates a template that we can easily add code to. The things we can modify are this like group ID and artifact ID, and we'll do that here. And instead of my company, we'll put Blondie Bytes. So I'm gonna take this command and then open the terminal. To open the terminal, you can just do something like this. It'll open a window like this. We'll CD the home directory and then CD desktop. That's where this project is gonna live. Then we'll create the project. We'll run the command. All right, if we run ls, there's my app, also here in the desktop. And it put a lot of things in here for us. One is this source folder, and the main code of our application will go inside this com all the way down to app and this app.java, and then the associated tests will go in this app.test file. For the most part, every code file will have an associated test file. So let's open these up in an IDE or a special software that we can use to manipulate the code. So I recently cleaned out my computer and apparently I deleted my IDE. So we're gonna go re-download it with IntelliJ. And I like this one, it has things like code completion, you can run the code with one button. That's why I like using something like this. We'll download the community version and let's see what version of Java we're running. Java dash dash version, Java 15. Uh, so we'll need a pretty up-to-date version of IntelliJ in order to run that. That'll be good. As long as you're using Java 8 and above, you should be fine. All right, here we are. We'll open it up uh, from the desktop. There's our app, we'll click open. So we can take a look at what code is here. On the left, there's this project pane, and this is where we can see the files that are in our project. Uh, so we have that app folder, which is gonna contain the code. In this case, it's just a hello world, pretty simple. And then we have the associated test file. And so this is just a test. This will always return true because it's given the condition true. So these two will always match, the test will pass. We also have these like play buttons. And so we can actually run the test by clicking the play button. Very similar to how you would run your code. You can also do it um, if you left click the Java folder, you can run all tests. So say you have a ton of tests in this, this can also be a useful one to just run all the tests. There are also ways to do this in the terminal or the command line, like great, our one test passed. But I find using the IDE is a little bit more user friendly. So we have this code and we're gonna try to do test driven development. And this is something where you're supposed to do test driven development, but you always learn how to write the code before you learn how to write the tests. So we're gonna try to do some test driven development and I'm gonna create a new Java class. So of course it will start with a little bit of code, but the implementation will wait until we write the tests to really flush that out. So I have this square class and we're gonna have a area function that will just return zero for now. We're also going to have a perimeter function. Both of these are gonna take in integers um, and it'll be that side length. So they'll have one input implementation we're not worrying about right now. And then we're also going to have function that returns a Boolean and it's gonna be has even side length. And we're gonna make all of these static for now so we don't have to create a square in order to use the function. And we'll just return false. And so not a lot of logic, not a lot of smarts with our square class, but we can go create a test class, write the tests for this, and then when we implement it, we can see if our implementation actually works. So I'm gonna create a new Java class, and so this test class, just a Java class with a few annotations. And I'm gonna upgrade my version to JUnit 5 before we get too crazy with our tests. 
So if we go into the POM, the POM file for a Maven project, it keeps track of your dependencies. We're actually gonna change this uh, because the whole group ID and artifact ID changed with the new version of JUnit. And here we are. So we'll grab this dependency, copy it. So we're just gonna take JUnit out, we're gonna paste that in, and the version that JUnit is actually running is 5.7.2, so we'll do 5.7.2, save that. We'll see if this works, and it does. So that little thing over there, if you did not have that on the right, you can also do this refresh button. So if you ever change your palm file, the dependencies will be reinstalled. Um, so let's go look at this one again. And our imports changed because now we're using JUnit 5. So we just have to re-import and I can just rewrite test and it'll import the correct item. Here it already knows, alt enter will import it for me and we've migrated to JUnit 5. So back into the square test, we can kind of look at this test class and really it just has methods annotated with this app test annotation. The methods we want to test are in this class. One of them's area, perimeter, has even side length. We'll start with area and we'll go public, void. I usually call it the same name as the function I'm testing. I'll go at test. And to call the function, we'll do square.area, since it is a static function, and I'll put in the side length three. Now the area of a square is that square length squared. So I could do something like assert equals six is the area, just kidding, nine is the area of this, tri of this square with the side length three. If we import this static method, this is a test. We're testing that the output of this static function is what we expect. Usually the pattern is to have the expected and then whatever the equation is or whatever the function call you're trying to test is. And we could put a bunch of different ones in here. We could also check that if the side length is zero, that the expected is zero. We could put a negative number, negative 30. What should that output? If anything at all, maybe it's still zero, maybe you make it positive. These would be things you have to think about. So that tests the area function. But we also have some other methods in our class, specifically that perimeter method. So I'm gonna create another test. We'll call it perimeter and we'll use that assert equals again. And these assertions basically test whether the expected is equal to whatever is being evaluated. If this is ever false, meaning that these two are not equal, the test will fail. And we'll take these same two from above. If the side length is negative or zero, the perimeter should also remain that. Now this works for most things where you need to compare primitive data types. And so ints, doubles, characters, there's also one called assert same, and so you're asserting that two objects have the same internal values. Another thing you can do is you can pull things out of objects and compare them. But let's look at a test, and this time, instead of returning a number, it's returning a boolean. So that would be has even side length. So for this one, we'll take these same values and we could do uh, dot has even side length. Now has even side length returns true or false. In this case, it'll be true. In this case, it'll be false. We'll just say false if it's not a square and it doesn't have a positive or a non-negative side length. So this is something we could do. Technically, it works. But JUnit actually has assert true, which we saw a little bit in the app test. And so instead of doing assert equals, we can just do assert true. It makes it a little bit shorter, a little bit more compact, and we don't need to put that true statement here. For the second one, we actually want to assert false. So instead of assert true, we use assert false. 
This works for Boolean values because there's only two possible values it could have, true or false. For numbers or characters or objects, there are a lot of different inputs that you can have, which is why something like assert equals was created. So we'll do the same thing here and we'll assert false for both of these. So now if we run our code, some of our tests will fail. We can run our tests with a left click on the Java file, run all tests. All right, so I found the issue. We had to go to our preferences and set this to 15. It was set to 1.7. And then also this palm file set that to 15 as well. 15 everywhere. And even like in your configurations, making sure this says 15, that they all match or whatever your Java version is. So now when we run the tests, they, they will still fail because we have not implemented the square class. We haven't implemented a lot of those functions. So we have some assertion errors. This basically means like we expected this, but actually got this from the function. And that's why the ordering of that parameter matters. And so now we're gonna implement the code in the square class and make these tests pass. So for area, side length times side length, for perimeter, it's side length times four. And then for has even side length, we'll go side length mod two equals equals zero. Think of this as division, but what is the remainder for that division? That's what the output of the expression is. So let's run our tests again now that we've implemented the code. So we can actually left click is what I'm doing here. We can run those tests again and we can see that they should all pass now and they do not so let's take a look and that is because we did not do our base case condition of if it is zero or negative 30 so here it's saying the actual is 900 so that would be for this test case and we should fix that if side length is less than return zero Put a nice little if statement in here and that's the value we'll want to return and then we'll kind of copy this paste it here and take this implementation here for has even side length we still want to do that comparison and in this case instead of returning zero we'll just return false we could do something with like tertiary those operators with like the the question mark and this i find those really confusing so that's why we're not doing that some also find it more helpful to do something like this where they don't do the else statement um since this returns you don't necessarily need the else and it makes it clearer that this is the condition being checked and for every other type of input we do this so that's another refactoring type thing we could do. Let's run our tests again, and this will rerun the failed tests. And so that is good. Of course, you can always fix one thing and break another. So before you upload your code, you always want to test all functions. And so that is what we've done here. They all pass. This is good. Now for what we've written, a lot of this is static, but since it's a class, you might have something like a private int side length and it's only set during the construction of the object and so we'll create a constructor and we'll set the side length up here equal to whatever's inputted into the function and instead of adding this as an input we'll just make these non-static or we'll make them instance methods and it'll pull the side length that we constructed with the constructor. But this will cause some problems because that is not how our tests are written. Our tests are written to call the function as a static method. Now what we can do is we can create a new square and give it that value three and then just call the method on the square. Now since the side length is immutable, we'll have to do this for each assertion. And this can, we'll follow this pattern all the way throughout here. This is another way we could write our tests. If we run these again, they will all pass and we get that in the console. Now let's say we made side length mutable. So it's something that's not final. We could also make it public. So this is something that we can reset and it's not a big deal. That means what we can do is we can create a private static square called under test. 
And this will be an object that we use to test the square functionality through all of our methods. So if I go new square, and we'll give it the side length four to start with. So instead of new square, I can do under test dot side length equals three, and then I can do under test area. Then I could do under test dot side length equals zero and do this same type of thing again. And that's another way we could write our code and test it with JUnit. Now let's kind of go back. And what if we wanted to throw an exception instead of returning zero? So what if we throw new, we'll say illegal argument exception, side length, is invalid. To test something like this, there are a few different options. It means that these two are gonna change. We're not expecting an assertion, instead we're gonna get a throwable. So we'll go throwable exception equals assert throws illegal argument exception, and then we'll give it a lambda with new square zero dot area. So what this is saying is that this function, this creating of the square and calling area will throw this exception. We get the exception back and we can assert equals that the exception dot message is equal to whatever the message is in here. So the fact that the side length is invalid. And we can do this same thing for the negative 30 as well. So this is what, how you could test an exception, not only that it throws the exception, but then it also throws the exception with the right message. This can be a little tricky here because you're not sure if it's the creation of the square or the area throwing the exception. So you could do something like square under test equals this, and then you could do under test, and that would make it a little bit more specific to the area function. Now this is a lot of testing in one function. We test a positive integer, or we test a few negative or invalid arguments, and what happens is it just says area. You're not sure what use cases you're testing. So something you can do is we'll copy this, and usually I'll do just the function name for like a normal case, so that would be this first case. And then for other cases or other buckets that the input might fall into where the output is different, I'll do an underscore, call it invalid side length. So it makes it clear what we're testing about the function. You could also do something like this with camel case. I kind of like the underscore or even something like this because it makes it clear that this is the function and then this is the use case I'm testing for the function. And so now when we run the code, we'll see that we've separated out like our normal case and then also like a special handling type case. It separates out what's actually failing versus having this really long function that just fails. You may have noticed this, but all of our functions return stuff. None of them return void in this square class. And what that means is it's easy to test that this output equals that output. You don't have to dive into the function or dive into the class in order to figure out what changed. We're creating a new piece of data rather than modifying data. And that pattern is often easier to test than testing the modification of an object. Now this is just an introduction to what you can do with JUnit, but there's so much more. If you take a look at the documentation, they have a user guide, they have Java docs. I showed you a few of the annotations to get you started, but now you can go in and learn about all these different annotations that could be useful. For example, there's this before each and after each. If there are certain things you want to happen before each test or after each test, you can use these annotations to create a single function that runs before each of the tests in that class. Same thing for before all, after all. I find these pretty useful to set up stuff before all the tests take place. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something new and I'll see you next time. Happy coding.